Welcome to Medscape. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner, reporting on the annual American Epilepsy Society meeting. With me today is my old friend and colleague, Dr. Salim Benbadis, Professor of Neurology and Director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. Welcome, Salim. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Salim, your group had a very interesting poster on cannabidiol for absence epilepsy. Isn't that right? Yes. All right. So before you delve into the specifics, tell me the background. Why did you do it? We did it because, as you know, uh, for typical absence seizures, there are very few options to treat. The only two medications over decades uh, that have been used and we know work for typical absence seizures are valproate and ethosuximide. If those do not work, the options are completely off-label. People, We try all kinds of other things, safe medications, which we have, but none of them have evidence to show that they work in typical absence seizures. So that's one part. As you also know, cannabidiol is approved as a pharmaceutical to treat certain types of seizures and epilepsy, but not that, not typical absence seizures. So our question was, well, it's a newer drug, it's approved and it works for some types of seizures. Might it work for typical absence seizures? That's the question. Now, when you say typical absence seizures, uh, are you talking about children or adults or both? Either or, but that means typical absence seizures in the context of an idiopathic generalized epilepsy. So the typical clear-cut three hertz spike wave complexes on EEG type of absence seizures. As you know, they usually begin in children, it's true, but we, we did enroll adults as long as they continue to have that type of seizures documented by EEG. This isn't a subjective diagnosis. Now these, uh, I when I... When I think of absence seizures, I think of these brief uh, staring spells, but these patients can also have convulsions. Was that part of the study? You are correct. Patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsies can also have myoclonic seizures and generalized tonic-clonic seizures, but the purpose of this study was to only determine if they work in typical absence seizures. All right, so tell me what you did. So as you also know, typical absence seizures are very brief can be subtle and are easily mixed. So we cannot rely on mom saying, yes, John had three absence seizures yesterday. It doesn't work, which by the way, is partially why we don't have a lot of studies on typical absence seizures. So we did it in what I think is an elegant and objective way, which is we did it by EEG. We did a 24 hour home EEG. Patient had to have a certain amount of spike wave complexes. So we have to have something to measure, but we measured objectively the spike wave burden. How many seconds in 24 hours does this patient spend in spike wave complexes? And as you know, that's not a subtle EEG finding. Anybody can see it. We just, we measured it, quantified it. How many seconds? 24 hours. Then we start the patient on cannabidiol, Epidiolex, the pharmaceutical cannabidiol, at a dose similar to what is approved on the market, but for other types of, of epilepsies. And then after, I believe it was 90 days, we do a second home EEG, and again, this is an objective measure, not what the parents think. Measure how many seconds in those 24 hours is the patient is, is the patient in spike wave complexes. And we are going to compare. All right. Now, before you uh, tell me the results, uh, as an EEG or myself, I'm interested in uh, exactly kind of the protocol because looking at 24 hours of EEG can be a little mind numbing and counting all these little bursts. Uh, did you use any software to help you? No, we use the EEG technologists who are, as you know, uh, experienced technologists are better than software. And again, those are not subtle findings. In fact, on the poster, we had a sample so people can see, okay, anybody can see this. It's just a question of counting them, as you said, but 24 hours is not that long. So three bursts of two seconds, that's six seconds, uh, five bursts of one second, that's five seconds. And then we made the total at the end. A little time so consuming, every, but easy. So every page they would sort of either, you know, every 10 seconds worth make a comment. There's something here, nothing here, and then yep. just go through the, okay. So, so it was looked at by human beings who know yes. what they're looking at. Yes. 
And so okay. we had a number. So EEG one, the patient spent uh, 422 seconds in spike wave complexes. And how long were they on the drug? 90 days, I believe it was. And used at do we titrated slowly. We used it in the same way that it's used on label, which as you know, is for mainly for Lennox Gasteau type of epilepsy. And you just added it to whatever they were already on? Yes. That's a good question. And they could be on nothing. We had a couple of patients, children that were not treated. The, the family didn't want to treat them. When we had a few that were on one or two seizure meds. Yeah, we added it to what they were currently on because we're going to compare pre-CBD and post-CBD as long as nothing else was changed. And this was 90 days? Yeah. All right. So 90 days later, you redid the study. You sent them home with the electrodes in a little box and they came back and the tech looked at it. And what'd you find? We found at the time of the presentation at AES, we had nine patients. We, it's a little more now and we're aiming for 15, but only two improved. In other words, the spike wave burden decreased. And in seven of them, not only did it not improve, but it increased. So this isn't what we were hoping to find, but it's very important because it means, and again, this is preliminary, it's pilot, there are flaws to this, we could do it better, but it, it would seem to indicate that possibly CBD falls under the category of many other seizure medications, which is they work for many types of motor seizures, but for typical absence seizures, which is a different bird, really, it may not be effective and possibly could even exacerbate it, which, as you know, other old drugs do. I think that's very important because when the FDA approved a cannabidiol for Dravet syndrome, Lennox Gasto, and seizures associated with tuberous sclerosis, uh, plus the, the anecdotal evidence of which there is a lot that somehow it helps for seizures. There's a lot of off-label use. And uh, here you have an example where off-label use in a controlled setting actually was not helpful at all. Right, and, and again, it's a small N. You could argue that the EEG 24 hour might be too short. You know, these EEGs fluctuate. Maybe it was bad luck. Uh, at that time, the child was stressed or didn't sleep well. So there was an increase. All of that is possible. And, and, but at least it's, it's motivating us to do another study, maybe with a longer EEG, maybe a three day EEG instead of one, maybe two follow up EEGs, not just one, things like that. But certainly it gives a signal that it's, it's not the panacea that we can say. And to be fair, like I said, other than nethosuximide and Valproate, when people use levetiracetam or lamotrigine for uh, typical absent seizures, there's also zero evidence that it works. All right. So one question that comes to mind, and I don't know if you looked at this or not, can cannabidiol affect the metabolism of ethosuximide or Valproate? So it might have changed the baseline level of the drugs they were taking. And, and that's a good question because, as you know, we know of at least one pharmacokinetic interaction uh, that, is, that is important for cannabidiol, and that is with clobazam, where they potentiate each other. So uh, we are not aware that it either inhibits or, or uh, uh, induces the metabolism of other medications. So that's, again, a good reason to do another cleaner, more controlled study. This was really a pilot, but we did not expect to find that. I must admit, uh, we, I thought we were going to find some efficacy. So in the next study, you'll do baseline drug levels and you'll do them at the end of the study also. That'll be easy. Yeah. And what about clinical seizures? After all, the, the patients are pretty interested in their clinical seizures. Do you well, think it's worthwhile trying to count them? Well, we, we, we did as a secondary, as well as quality of life, we did. We asked the parents, you know, how do you feel she's doing? And, but, but that's so subjective, especially for absent seizures. We did make a note of it. And sometimes it agreed with the objective measure and sometimes it didn't. So the, the, the spike wave burden might be reduced to say, no, she's worse and vice versa. I, I really feel that the strength of this was that it's really obje an objective and quantitative measure of the spike wave absence burden. Well, I think this is very important, very exciting, and it's going to lead to another presentation uh, next year, right? I hope uh, so. You'll have it done by next year. Are you recruiting patients now? We still are. Uh, we The goal was 15, so we have a few more to go, and then uh, hopefully we'll publish this. Nobody loves negative results, but it's important, as you said. Uh, before we wrap up, Celine, is there anything you'd like to add? 
Uh, no, it, it's good to have new uh, drugs. Uh, and as you said, there is a lot of off-label use. So I think, like you said, this is an important uh, piece of information for clinicians. Dr. Salim ben Bedis, I want to thank you very much for joining us on Medscape. Thank you for having me.